Good morning. We will now try to uh, get started with this uh, second session. So if I can please uh, call the room to order and we will get started in just a few seconds. Thank you. Very well, let's get, uh, let get started. Uh, good uh, morning, my name is Juan Paulo Hofmeister. I'm the Multilateral Governance Manager uh, in the Office of Governance Affairs of the Green Climate Fund. And I'm delighted to see so many partners back here in Korea. Um, let me um, start by welcoming uh, a very distinguished panel who will be um, being enlightened with some remarks this, this morning. Um, so let me invite them to please uh, take their, their chairs um, and I will be introducing them just in a moment. Uh, so please, if I can invite um, Minister Koye and, and um, Lillian and Archie to please join me up here. Um, uh, so this session, we are intending uh, to, take, to take stock, um, to look at what's been the journey the GCF um, has, uh, been undertaking over the, this replenishment period um, and also put it in the bigger context of what are some of the needs and some of the, the, the lessons we have learned in this process. Uh, for this, I am delighted uh, to be joined by uh, three distinguished colleagues here with me on, on the stage today and one uh, that will be joining remotely. Um, first, uh, Minister Kodio for Belize, um, who uh, will be uh, providing uh, some remarks and some reflections following a presentation that I will be uh, giving, uh, followed by my colleague Lillian uh, Macharia, or Director of the Division of Portfolio Management, and my colleague Archie Storga from the GCF uh, uh, Independent Evaluation Unit. And I'm also pleased to have uh, our colleague Chisura Oki from the Global Environment Facility uh, joining us virtually. Unfortunately, we were not able to have um, the uh, participation in person of uh, Minister Nassim of the Maldives today. Uh, we regret uh, this logistical challenge. Um, and so with that, I would like to then uh, um, get this session started. So if I can ask, uh, please, to, to have the, the PowerPoint. Um, what I'd like to do is just sort of provide a little bit of context as we are entering this conversation uh, before inviting some of our panelists uh, to present. Um, so first, uh, we can get the PowerPoint. So um, some, some very um, uh, important facts at, at, at this moment and sort of to make sure that we're all in the same page and we're entering these conversations over the next few days. First of all, uh, we are delighted to have seen the uptick in the submission of NDCs and NAPs. Um, now the number, the total number counted goes to over a hundred, more than 150 new and updated NDCs. This provides the context of where the climate global ambition is at. We know it's not sufficient. The science is telling us um, the latest IPCC uh, reports are, are, are clear, are conclusive, uh, and have made it categorically uh, um, clear to everyone that we require a, an important shift away from these incremental changes towards uh, more systemic responses. We have been able over the last few years to have important technologies that have been, that are now available. And now the challenge is to figure out how we do the diffusion of these technologies, particularly to developing countries. Climate finance has also increased, but most certainly not at the required pace. So we do need to understand what are being some of the barriers there. How do we do uh, this, uh, the, the, the work around uh, developing a comprehensive and robust approach to NDC investment um, for both mitigation and adaptation? And of course, the, the challenge we're in is certainly not a favorite, the, the, the landscape we're in is not a favorite one. We know that we are facing more and more uh, macroeconomic con conditions that are not favorable for, uh, uh, for climate ambition. And this is the context um, we're working in. If we can go to uh, the next slide, and I will conclude with this. So 
we know that the investment needs are in orders of magnitude way uh, above anything that we have been able to mobilize yet. And, and so this is a very important challenge and we go into this conversation. We know from the assessment and here the UNFCCC has been particularly helpful in beginning to take um, a, a clear temperature of what are the, the, the scale of the needs. Um, and we, knew, we do need to understand these needs much better. We, we, need, we need to make a jump from, from just understanding the needs towards what is actually uh, invest, uh, solutions we can invest in and beginning to mobilize these resources that are required. And so this is already um, something that we, we are seeing uh, and that we, we will be discussing over the next few days, particularly in the context that the readiness uh, support can play in, in getting us to this point. And of course, the GCF pipeline already as it is, it's quite large. And we do know that um, the, the resources uh, are, are simply not sufficient. So on one hand, we, we already have needs that are way above anything that we uh, can meet. And we do need to actually even further strengthen how we go about translating those needs into uh, bankable solutions. So I will stop there. And I will now like to invite my colleague uh, Lilian um, to provide an overview and um, some reflections um, specifically uh, for everyone to understand where the GCF currently stands in the implementation and delivering of results and uh, the impact for climate action. So with that, Lillian, over to you. Hello, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. So as my colleague has indicated, I will present a very quick and high level overview of where we are um, as GCF. Um, the bulk of the work in terms of explaining our ambitions and what we are trying to achieve and what we've been trying to do as a GCF was done in the earlier session by Yannick, uh, where he indicated our focus in terms of speed, volume, and also being very responsive. But just to give you a, a quick view, um, if you go to the next slide, you might be aware that the GCF provides support to the target countries. Um, so next slide, please. Um, through two windows. Um, one of them being the readiness support program, and that's meant to help countries in terms of building their capacity, the adaptation planning, generating a pipeline for funding, and it also encompasses support also to, um, towards developing strategic frameworks. And to date, uh, we have been able to support, uh, provide 590 grants, which are all amounting to well north of 420. And if we add the project preparation facility, this becomes a lot more in terms of both uh, the grant number of grants and uh, amounts of resources. Through the funded activities where we do more the substantive projects, we've been able to have 200 projects approved to date. And these have led us to be managing a portfolio of both, uh, well over $40 billion of which GCF is about, uh, GCF's investment is about 11 billion. Um, so if we now walk towards, if I look at the trajectory, um, I think in response to our maturity as an institution and also in response to the growing needs, also cognizant of the resources that have been availed to us, you will see that the GCF has made significant you know, progress and has been pretty responsive, registering a huge growth in terms of the projects and grants that have been support, uh, have been uh, funded by the GCF. Under the readiness grant um, program, we currently have benefited and been able to support 141 countries, as indicated earlier, with 590 grants, both in terms of adaptation planning and other uh, capacity building initiatives. And specifically to those uh, countries that actually are very keen to get investments, we've also been supporting project preparation. Currently, uh, supporting well over 64 countries uh, and having supported this through 50 grants. Again, um, this is just to manifest to show how we've been at least responded in this regard. And, and it's not just a matter of approvals. We have been disbursing those resources. And we can see as of today, we have at least half of the approved resources have already been disbursed to the countries that are implementing. And this is notwithstanding 
some of the hiccups you've been experiencing uh, with COVID going forward. So uh, we expect that as the situation normalizes, as also our countries and our partners get used to the requirements that we should be seeing um, a much faster implementation as well as uptake of the support. Um, now turning over to the funded activities in the next slide, it also notes the similar trend in terms of our ability to respond. From the first project that was approved in 2015, we are currently having 200, as indicated, 200 projects currently approved. And this, of course, is has led us to having uh, 10.8 billion worth of uh, resources already committed. Um, and, and what we are saying here is that um, we are, we've been actually keeping up with the resources available to us because we understand that climate, um, the climate impacts are, are need to be addressed very urgently. Um, as you can also see, we've also matched the approvals with an increased pace of implementation. And you can already see that already more than 70% of approved resources are under implementation. And we're expecting that by the end of the year, about 80% of the projects that would have been approved would be under implementation. And this has also been, to a certain extent, matched by disbursements, which though have significantly lagged the, uh, the implementation. And, and again, uh, we all know the context within which we've been operating, especially with COVID, but that notwithstanding, at least about a quarter of the resources that have been approved are already uh, out on the ground. Now, looking at the actual impacts, you will note that um, in line with the maturity of the of the projects given and, and also the learnings, the, we have increased the pace at which you're delivering results. So from about you know, um, 2.5 million beneficiaries, which were reached, we had reached by 2017. Uh, today, we have more than 10 times, we reached more than 10 times that number of beneficiaries, both directly and indirectly through our projects. And this is currently actual. And this represents about 10% of what we expect to reach by the end of all the time, all the projects that have been approved have been, um, have been fully implemented. And, and the thinking here is that we, we expect that we'll pick up momentum more as projects now get into the faster, more mature phase. A lot of the projects take a bit of time to get started, but as you can already see over the 2020, 2021, the growth was tremendous and we expect that this will actually be better now that we are coming out of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, if we turn over to the carbon dioxide uh, emission reduction targets, you will see that if you go to the next slide, please, you will also note that we have similar trajectory. And to date, we have been able to minimize at least abate uh, 63 million tons of carbon dioxide, which is, I, I think, again, just a tip of the iceberg. We expect that a lot of these impacts will be realized as we go on, especially once some of the projects come online and get connected to the grid or some of the afforestation of you know, planting efforts come, come to bear. But I think the point here is to just note the very encouraging trend in terms of results delivery, notwithstanding the very difficult phase that which you've come out of. Now, if we move on to the next slide uh, and look at how GCF is delivering against the mandate given by uh, via the governing instrument, as well as by the board, you note that we are almost at a 50-50 balance uh, between mitigation and adaptation. Uh, in terms of volume, slightly more towards leaning towards mitigation by 1%. But if you look at the number of projects, a lot of the projects that we have approved are largely in the um, adaptation, under the adaptation theme, which is just speaks to the size of projects vis-a-vis -vis the amounts. Um, now, again, looking at the beneficiaries, we have continued to deliver on um, reaching, increasing the number of beneficiaries we are looking at. And the GCF1, we are slightly below the previous uh, initial resource mobilization, but we expect that with the new approvals coming online that the expected beneficiaries will probably match or exceed the, the previous, um, previous targets, the baseline. Uh, we have exceeded already uh, our expected targets on, on carbon emission reductions. Now, one of the areas that we've done extremely well and continue to do so is our support, uh, our uh, the amount of adaptation funding that is directed towards the vulnerable countries. Um, as per the targets, we are supposed to deliver at least 50 of 
the, the adaptation funding resources to uh, small island development states, least developed countries and African states. Um, but as of today, we are well above that target at 65%. And this is pretty much uh, also in line with what we had in the initial resource mobilization period. And even looking at the pipeline, we expect that we shall still continue to trend above the 50% um, threshold that we had been set for. Our support to the direct accredited entities is also increasing. And I think this is in, in, in real uh, response to the calls for en enhancing capacity at local levels and ensuring that we are helping countries that also foster uh, the ownership of the climate efforts. And as you can see, we've already in exceeded the benchmark that was there at the beginning of the initial resource mobilization at GCF1. And we expect that this will go, as you can already see that the pipeline is also trending well above uh, the, current, the, current, um, at the current status. In terms of support pri to private sector, um, we are slightly below the initial um, resource mobilization targets, but we still much, pretty much within the same bandwidth. And again, we expect that with the upcoming um, approvals before the GCF1 is over, we should be able to match or exceed, um, exceed the, the baseline target. And as you can also see in the pipeline, these figures again are trending upwards. So all in all, I think you might see that uh, GCF is really continuing to deliver against and beyond the target set. And if you also look at our leveraging factor, we have been able to leverage at least 3.3 more, three more uh, at least three times what we have been invested, the kind of, uh, the amount of funding that has been invested in us. And private sector, as, as expected, has slightly more uh, leverage that it's able to bring on online. And we expect that with the, um, with the adoption of the private sector strategy, we shall do a lot more in this area and of course, reach even more of the private sector and help leverage the much needed resources towards climate ambition. So in terms of lessons learned, um, and I'll just talk about very high levels, but I think with the growth of a portfolio, we've noted the need to have strong and digitized systems that enhance both the efficiency and also help us be more transparent about how the, the fund is operating. So we are rolling out quite a number of initiatives to help our partners be able to submit their requests online and help us also be able to respond very quickly. Um, together with that, we've also strengthened our results management systems so that our res we are able to measure and align our efforts to make sure that we are delivering the maximum you know, possible results with the resources avail available to us and that those results are collected in a credible manner and also available on a, on a real-time basis. And having those systems also help us make, make the corrective actions to make sure that we are delivering on the mandate that we are given. And to couple that and to sort of underscore that we have then strengthened our data management systems, we think these are very important so that uh, we, are, we are able to be more responsive to the needs. We can see where the issues are and we manage risks proactively and also make sure that we are performing in line with expectations. And having those data systems also helps us have better transparency um, and also make sure that we can harness the insights from both the implementation and uh, the trends that we are seeing to improve on our delivery, as well as also share those lessons with our partners so that all of us become you know, better from the experience that we have. So quickly moving on to the final, um, final slide, I think then just to kind of underline what we have done from those lessons is of course, as I indicated, we are strengthening our risk management and data management systems. We are also increasing our digitization to improve efficiencies and transparency. We've strengthened, strengthened our results management and rolled out guidance so that it's easier to make sure that everybody knows the expectations. And we also have guide support to make sure that they can meet those expectations. And we are strengthening our knowledge management, including the launch of an online data library, which should help every stakeholder to be able to go online and query and see what kind of support is DCF giving maybe to my region, to a certain sector, to certain types of institutions. Uh, we also coming up with a readiness knowledge bank, which will be a, for a platform that will enable you know, the different partners to access knowledge and information on what's working or not working in different areas and also use that to sort of, you know, showcase the, the what's work, you know, the best efforts and what the impacts that we're being able to get. 
and we are strengthening our learning loops both internally as well as with our partners so that we, we create a virtuous cycle of improvements. And with that, I think I'll stop and uh, hand over to Juan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lillian. And uh, in, this is indeed going to be a conversation over the next few days. Um, and, and your insights uh, are very helpful to, to understand the big picture. Uh, before I invite uh, His Excellency uh, Minister uh, Christopher Coyote to, to uh, share a few reflections, um, I actually we also want to hear from you. Um, and we will be collecting some feedback using uh, the Menti app. So if we can put uh, the slide on the screen so that people can um, provide some insights on what you see as priority gaps and we will be coming back to uh, this at the end of the session. So with this, um, I'd like to invite um, Minister Koya to please, of Belize, to please uh, come join us for uh, some reflections uh, on, the ref on the journey that, that Belize has taken and your experience, of course, working uh, with DCF, but also uh, your reflections on uh, the importance of uh, mobilizing other partners, working, uh, working with others, including some of our fellow climate funds. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to invite you to come to the podium, Minister. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here before you today to speak on our Belize experience. Before I speak of our evolving relationship with the GCF, I wish at the outset to underscore three critical factors that Belize must perennially account for as we seek to couple sustainable human development of our people along with resilience building. We are small, we are vulnerable, amongst the most vulnerable in the world, and we face compounding risks and cumulative impacts from past, present, and anticipated global threats, climate and otherwise. These factors have resulted in three other overriding concerns that stunt our development and climate resilience building. We are high risk, we are highly indebted, and we are facing increasingly limited fiscal space. It is through these lens that we share our experiences with GCF today. Our experience with the GCF has evolved over the years. As vulnerable as we are to climate change and extreme weather events, we look forward to material mobilization of climate finance for our resilience building. We see GCF as a key partner in this effort. Unfortunately, time passes, and while the will is there, tangible results are slow in coming. Initially, the focus of the relationship with GCF has been on building resilience and capacity for climate finance. While this has progressed, we only have one national GCF accredited entity today, which is limited in scope to micro projects not exceeding $10 million. Applications for accreditation for additional entities, primarily public sector entities, have moved forward at a snail's pace, in one instance already exceeding three years. This reality has no doubt influenced the involvement of GCF funds in climate resiliency projects in Belize. At present, we really only have one project in implementation. That is the Resilient Rural Belize or the Be Resilient program. This program is a $20 million program of which $8 million is funded by the GCF through a contribution of 6 million in grants and 2 million in concessionary loan. The balance includes counterpart financing from the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, our implementing partner for this program, and counterpart contributions from the government of Belize, 
and beneficiary farmers and cooperatives. The Bee Resilient Program aims to introduce climate resilient agricultural practices in 23 rural communities, more than 12% of all rural communities in Belize, to allow small farmers to increase production and improve market access. The bulk of the disbursements will be for roughly 30 miles of improved rural road networks and storage facilities for farmers. In addition, the program provides home gardening resilience training and small grants to low income individuals, most of whom are women and youth, to undertake the establishment of backyard or community gardens. The program also provides matching grant funds, investments to farmer cooperatives in all six districts in Belize to pay for supplies and equipment, improved immigration, irrigation facilities, storage facilities, construction and land preparation. It is intended that 30,000 persons or almost 15% of our rural population will benefit from this program. While the project is in its fourth year of implementation, implementation only substantively commenced last year and has since been progressing at a brisk pace. As a result, roughly 1% of GCF funds have to date been utilized in implementation of this project. To date, of roughly $5.5 million of GCF dispersed funds to Belize programs, not just the RRB program, more than 95% has been sent, spent on consultancies and reports for readiness instead of actual resilience building. Contrast this with GCF's entire portfolio disbursement, where over two and a half billion disbursed, over 330 million or 13% has been spent on readiness. So in other words, whereas over 85% of GCF's portfolio disbursement has been spent on resilience building in Belize, that number is less than 5%. Some lessons learned from our relationship with GCF today include as follows. To enable more efficient project implementation, it is strongly recommended that implementing partners are either national or regional. While we appreciate the support of partners like EFAD, it is logistically difficult to progress implementation efficiently when your implementing partner is halfway across the world. To support this recommendation, Belize strongly recommends and encourages GCF to fast track accreditation to local or national entities that can serve as effective implementing partners. Belize also recommends that the simplified approval process be more simplified and that the applicable rules not keep changing. Additionally, Belize's, Belize proposes direct allocations to the country for building national capacity. The use of intermediaries in this effort severely inhibits the capacity development process. Belize also sees positives in the experience with the RRB program. Most significantly, we underscore the value of co-funding arrangements for GCF-funded programs. This permits levering up GCF climate finance for greater resiliency building. In this vein, not only has Belize successfully mobilized climate finance in private markets through its successful Blue Bond offering, but also together with key conservation partners, the World Wildlife Fund and the Enduring Earth Partnership to jointly mobilize public and private capital, Belize has embarked upon the world's first marine and coastal project finance for permanent initiative with a view to ensure the resilience of key marine and coastal ecosystems while supporting the well-being of our citizens. This latter effort is expected to include funding of no less than 4 million from the GEF. Overall, no doubt, the experience of Belize is not a unique one but it is hoped that it will serve to guide an expedited transition from readiness 
for meaningful resilience building. We can't wait anymore. Climate change is already here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Your perspective is indeed quite sobering and, and it helps us put in context uh, this, uh, this challenge we're, we're all in. Um, uh, we certainly are not shy of understanding and working with you in how we address some of these, these uh, shortcomings. Um, I think that your recommendations on efficiency um, are, are well received and something that uh, it's precisely some of the improvements that we hope to discuss during this session, uh, this next few days, um, as we go into developing the strategy for what will be the next trust fund. So uh, let me thank you. I know you probably will need to leave in a few minutes, so that's well understood, but uh, thank you very much. So with this, I would like to now invite uh, my colleague Chisuru Aoki of the Jeff that is connecting uh, virtually uh, to provide some reflections. Jeff is a key partner of uh, the GCF as our sister fund under, under the UNFCCC. Um, and it will be with this that I'd like to invite Chase to provide some reflections as the Jeff is also uh, taking new steps in this, in this journey uh, in the launch with the launch of Jeff 8, um, but also your perspectives on the, the role of the collaboration uh, with GCF uh, as we um, look to support the same countries. Uh, Chase, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? All right, over to you, Chis. Can you hear me okay? Just one, two. Testing yes. one, two. One yes. second, one second, hold on. Okay. Testing, no, it's not coming. Zoom audio. Hello. Just Hello? give us a minute. I'm not hear you. If I'm not okay. sure Just give there. us a minute. All right. Testing one two. Testing one two. Yeah. We... I can hear Testing. you fine. Yeah. Not one yet. second. <laughs> one second. One second. Hold on. Looks like our audio is not coming out. Test one two. Hello. Testing one two. Yeah. One yes. second. One second. Hold on. Testing one two. Testing one two. Test. Test. If the colleagues are are working to hello uh, fix this, so we'll give a minute. Perhaps if it's okay, maybe I will go to Archie while we get uh, this sorted. Uh, if that's okay with you, I see the thumbs up. So thank you very much, um, Archie. Um, I'd like to turn to you. Of course, the, the role of the IU in uh, capturing Test. some of these lessons. Uh, it's quite key um, and uh, would like to invite you to um, share some of the, 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 the key highlights. Uh, we don't have time to go over everything uh, right now, of course, <laughs> that, that the IU has been doing over the last few years, but in this context, some key messages from the IU uh, on the, your evaluations on results and impacts um, of the GCF work on the ground, Archie. Thank you, Juan. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Archie Rastogi. I'm represent, representing here the Independent Evaluation Unit of the GCF. The unit informs the decision-making of the board, and we've undertaken several evaluations, as Juan said, through the journey of the GCF, including process evaluations like accreditation and SAP, portfolio evaluations like SIDS and LDCs, and performance reviews. We did a first performance review in 2019, and we're now doing the second performance review. So our evaluations help to signpost the journey of the GCF, as it were. And uh, and uh, we have three key messages for you that we're bringing out today. So just to set the context, of course, Lillian's given us a range of numbers of the portfolio of the GCF. Uh, beyond the portfolio itself, the GCF ha is an incredible institu institution with an extraordinary mandate. Uh, whether it's the parity between the on the govern on the board, but, uh, the parity between the developing and the developed countries, the concept of country ownership and direct access, that's all quite unique to climate finance. And this has never been done before. So this is all quite unique. And the GCF has accomplished a lot of a uh, lot and come a long way in establishing itself as a fully functioning institution. But among the three key messages we want to uh, bring to you, the first would relate to uh, processes. 
as his excellency said it's still very hard to uh, get accredited to the gcf it's still quite hard to get resources from the gcf whether it's fp approvals or readiness and other windows of the gcf this has challenges not just for the uh, not just for the uh, reputation of the gcf and its reputation as a credible partner but also in it, it, it also limits its ability to deal with the needs of the uh, uh, to 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 fulfill its mandate on urgency especially at the needs of the sids and the ldcs and so while the secretariat has made a lot of effort in the last few years on uh, optimizing processes there's still need uh, there's still a lot of need to do a lot more and we continue to recommend that we're also getting mixed messages from the countries whether the gcf is best as a uh, should be more hands off a lot of entities have a lot of experience implementing projects and gcf should be more hands off but on the other hand there is this expectation for the gcf to step in when things go wrong uh, to to adjust and to to uh, and to to guide and uh, to guide and be their part of the process uh, so, so the message there is to keep continue to address some of those uh, those uh, those issues and processes, but all of, some of those uh, the challenges of optimization emerge from a lack of clarity in strategy, and that's the second point. That for many of these processes, the overall purpose may not be extremely clear, whether it's country programs or entity work programs and accreditation. Also, in some ways, uh, the purpose can be clarified. As you're all here today, you're also informing the strategy of the GCF, as, as Yannick said in his address. There is some prioritization happening of resources, whether it comes to instruments, whether it's geographies, whether it's adaptation mitigation or different sectors. But that pattern is not very clear from the outside. Uh, all of you will have bilaterals, or many of you will have bilaterals, and there is some sort of strategy that's informing those decisions. But what those decisions are and what that strategy is should be very clear to not just those in the room, but those outside of it and those that can't be here. At the country level, GCF, when we when we when we do our country case studies, we have often told that the GCF is seen as a as a very valuable partner, but as a value, valuable provider of climate finance. GCF projects seem to be addressing some gaps in at the subsectoral level. They're pushing the paradigm whether it's by scale or bringing up the timing of the finance that they provide. But the GCF is not yet seen as the, as the climate finance uh, partner. It's not yet seen as the strategic partner or a planning partner or a convening partner. So that's the other thing we're, we're asking you to do. As you, do as, you, as you go about doing the, uh, the next few days, as you're thinking about programming for the GCF, to think about that, uh, that role quite clearly, the role that the GCF should play in the climate finance architecture of the world and at the national level, so that the GCF is not just filling gaps in programming for countries and entities, but it is in fact addressing some of the most urgent needs of the, uh, for the countries. And that's that's the other message. Uh, and the final message that I want to bring to you uh, would be related to risks. As Lillian said, a lot of the projects are under implementation. A lot of experience is emerging. But some of that evidence is still limited. We only have access to, for instance, only about 15 midterm evaluations so far from the very large portfolio of the GCF. But what's emerging from that, uh, from the analysis of some of that portfolio is that more attention can be paid to risk management. And Lillian referred to the efforts by the Secretariat on addressing gaps in the risk management frameworks. But some of those challenges can be addressed pr proactively. And that's aligns as well very well with what Lillian said in the design of the projects. So as you go, as you're as you're thinking of projects and programming for the GCF in the short term and the medium term future, that's yet another thing to think about is how to address risks proactively. This may even actually help address some of the timing issues and some of the process issues that emerge during implementation of GCF projects later. So those three messages uh, addressing uh, process efficiency, clarifying this, the the GCF's role at the country level and at the world at the uh, global level, and then building for risks as you design projects and programs. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Archie. That that's uh, very succinct uh, recommendations and and questions actually really. For, for all of you um, as we're embarking these conversations over the next few days, it's clear that the GCF cannot be everything at 
all the time everywhere. Uh, there needs to be clarification and prioritization in order to better assist uh, our partners. Um, so thank you very much, Archie. I would now like to turn back to Chisuru, hoping that this time uh, we can hear her. Uh, Chis, are you? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Juan, and good morning, colleagues. And thank you for inviting me to participate um, on this um, panel that has so far been very insightful. Um, you know, I was actually scheduled to go to um, Korea to attend this meeting in person, but um, I had to cancel my trip due to uh, a very sudden and tragic death of my um, boss 10 days ago. So um, we're kind of still in shock in a crisis mode. And I very much appreciate the uh, consideration extended by the GCF colleagues for me to participate remotely. So let me share two reasons why we think it's important for the, the two entities, the Japan GCF, to work together. Because the question that's posed to me is about really sharing the views on the importance of complementarity and coherence. And um, so the first reason is that the Japan GCF have mutually reinforcing goals and vision. And we know that the, the two institutions share the role of supporting the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the UNCCC. The GEF also serves four additional conventions and can also support systemic integrated solutions. And I'd like to say thank you to Excellency Koi for pointing out the existing GEF and GCF support in um, Belize. The GCF has a much deeper focus on climate finance from readiness to private sector. So through collaboration, we can help countries and institutions to have more clarity on the entry points to support, um, uh, to support their climate priorities from the two institutions. And I think uh, working together, we can also aim for higher impact. And another issue that um, I, I'd like to bring up is that the, by working together, I do think the two institutions can help enhance access and predictability, predictability of support, which are the two issues that have been pointed out time and again by countries that the two, uh, the Japan GCF would need to, to really um, continue to enhance. And um, as a matter of fact, the, the Japan GCF have received guidance from the COP on enhancing complementarity as well as coherence. So the countries are asking us to work together and we're happy to be working together. Now, the second reason why uh, we know it's important for the two entities to work together, an arguably more urgent reason, it has to do with the scarcity of multilateral climate finance, particularly through the financial mechanism. Um, the GEF so far has supported close to 1,500 climate mitigation adaptation projects, mobilized about $10 billion, grant resources, leveraged about $70 billion. We just had a very successful replenishment of $5.33 billion for Jeff Trust Fund and the support flow of about $1.2 billion for the, um, the two funds that we have for adaptation. So what that means is that we can expect to mobilize through the Jeff about a billion, 1.5 billion, maybe $2 billion in climate finance annually from 2022 to 26. And let us also hope that the GCF will have a very successful and robust replenishment. So even between the two institutions pulled together, we still represent a fairly modest portion of the 100 billion mark that, that we are all striving to, to achieve and, and go beyond. So what this means is that the um, aligning priorities and major initiatives between the Japan GCF and working to leverage additional support from all sources, we think is extremely important. So this is, um, um, these are the reasons as well as building on our history of working together, we have what's called the LTV. The LTV stands for the long-term vision on complementarity, coherence, and collaboration. It's basically a roadmap for the Jeff and GCF to work together. And I think it's fair to say we have come a long way and our current collaboration is very solid, forward-looking, and the full engagement of the respective heads of the G GAF and GCF, Yannick, as well as my CEO, uh, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez. And um, the, the LTV has also been presented to the Jeff Council as well as a GCF board. So this actually defines specific areas of cooperation 
where complementary action might be more or most efficient and effective. And um, the LTV also explores possible modalities to generate longer lasting mitigation adaptation outcomes. So one more issue that I was asked to quickly touch upon was the, the outlook for joint programming in GEF-8 and GCF-2 guided by the LTV. So we're um, very excited to be carrying out what we call the joint national investment planning exercises. Uh, we would like to do this in five countries together between the GEF and GCF within the next year or two. And this is a, a very good opportunity for countries to capitalize on fresh resources allocated from the GEF and G, uh, GEF 8 and the GCF 2. And to delve into planning, delve into planning how to effectively use the GEF and GCF resources for um, more enhanced climate action and also to leverage support from all its resources. Um, the second element um, outlook is the major initiatives. We're keen to expand the menu of these major initiatives, including perhaps energy transition, innovation, initiative targeting CIS, initiatives targeting LDCs, and also the private sector. And this kind of major initiatives efforts can build on the first batch of major uh, support that we have done already together, such as the Great Green Wall, as well as the Amazon program. And finally, one more element I wanted to point out is the uh, the joint work we're undertaking on policies and processes. Um, ultimately, enhancing complementarity and coherence and pushing for ease of access will depend on the ability of the two funds to have complementary complementary policies and processes. And um, ultimately, this also needs the blessing of the governing bodies. We're currently working to commission an independent uh, comparative analysis of processes and policies of the Japan GCF. And this includes what are the investment criteria, what are the priorities, what are the funding modalities, results, timelines, and milestones. And this analysis we're hoping to generate um, a list of opportunities to streamline operational procedures, policies, and project cycles to really enable better coordination and increased efficiency for the two funds to work together. So with that, um, I'd like to say thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the, the, the remaining time we have in this particular um, panel. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chis, and, and it's been indeed uh, a journey in our collaboration, and uh, we look forward uh, very much to the, the steps ahead. And of course, to allow me once again to express on behalf of the GCF, or more sincere condolences for the passing of, of Gustavo, um, who was a champion and pioneer in uh, the defense of our planet. Um, I would, uh, we're, we're a little bit um, over time uh, and uh, I would like to now go back to uh, the, the, some of the feedback that we've been collecting from you. Um, and so if we can put it on the screen um, and some of the, the, the key priorities and, and gaps that, that are emerging from the feedback we've been getting from you. Uh, of course, uh, the, the discussion doesn't really stop here. Uh, the discussion, uh, in fact, uh, my colleagues, uh, Selena and Ramona will be directing the next session where uh, precisely a good amount of the how we actually begin to address some of these gaps uh, gets to be unpacked and, and we hopefully uh, will be having more feedback from you. We do nevertheless still have a few minutes and I'd like to actually go back uh, to our panelists uh, for any reflections or any reactions as you hear one another on um, some of the ideas that have been picked up um, uh, from, from your fellow panelists. Um, so perhaps if I can invite Lillian for, for any reflections uh, before we move to the next session. Well, thanks, Juan, and also thanks, uh, colleagues and panel members who made their presentation today. Um, I think from from my side, and maybe speaking for so the Secretariat, I would say we are listening to what our partners are saying, and we are trying our very best to make sure that we respond to the various expectations. Um, I think. Uh, as in line with the growing institution, I think we are very open to learning as much as we can, uh, but we also also very also alive to the fact that we are also limited as a single institution in what we can address 
within the realm of climate finance. So I think it we will continue having a conversation as to, um, as, as I think was clearly said, to make sure that we are very clear on, on our strategy and our prioritization because we may not be able to respond to everything. Um, I, I, I hear the comments around uh, country ownership and being faster in, in approval. And I think we've tried very much to improve that and we continue to work with our countries. But I'd also say, uh, I think since I sit on the implementation side, I also see some other aspects that impacts the speed and also that also reflect some of the challenges that we will continue to have if we're really trying to, um, to deliver results. Um, and that includes sometimes even the limited capacities in those countries. So we may want to move a lot faster, but we also have to work with the, within the context that, and the realities that exist. Um, but, but I think this will continue to be a joint effort as indicated by uh, my colleague from Jeff. We will continue to collaborate um, I think, as Yannick also mentioned earlier, GCF is a partnership organization, and therefore it, it takes everybody's effort to make sure that we're able to meet those aspirations. Uh, that means the countries themselves in trying to make sure that we prioritize and follow through uh, our partners who we, we rely on to deliver. And also in terms of GCF, in terms of making sure that we're very clear on our requirements, and we're also responding to the realities and the, and the demands. Uh, but again, we also need to also, I think, as we head towards replenishment, given the level of aspiration, I think it also needs to be matched by the resources that are allocated to GCF. So I think we're also counting on all our partners also and contributors to step up to meet the urgency of the demands and also to help us be able to have in place the capacity to respond to the diverse needs of, of the country. So I would just say that we hear you. Uh, but we and we look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. I might add something that's that's aligning with what Lillian is saying. That some of that clarity, uh, some of the processes of the GCF uh, resemble one objective or the other, which could be a, 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 a hands-on partner or a second-level due, due diligence partner. So there is some ambiguity there that we are finding in our evaluations, whether the processes match one character or the other. And I think what we're asking for is also, as you go about drafting this USP and the next session is dedicated to the strategy of the GCF, to make that character quite clear, whether the GCF intends to be the hands-on partner or it intends to be the second level due diligence partner, leaving the uh, due diligence to partners in the countries. While the direction of travel for the GCF is quite clear, no one would argue against building resilience and, uh, and addressing climate impacts. It's the quality of travel that's quite important. Who comes along on the journey? Uh, at what speed do we travel? Does everyone travel together? Are we okay with, uh, with uh, taking different actors at different speeds, etc.? So that still remains to be addressed. And we've come quite a long way in the last uh, 10 odd years to, to clarify many parts of this travel, but not yet the complete uh, the complete uh, clarity. And realism again, uh, while the GCF has the mandate of a superhero, but there are many Marvel movies that actually, uh, that, that, whose revenue is far higher than the portfolio of the GCF. So that realism is quite important in what the resources available are at hand and what the mandate is. And yet, this institution has to work because a the urgency of the of climate uh, cl climate is uh, is I don't need to mention about anything about that but also to prevent the fragmentation of climate finance there's only limited public sector climate finance available and for for that this institution has to work at an optimum level and deliver that uh, impact uh, deliver climate finance uh, to address the urgent needs of developing countries thank you. Uh, thank you, Archie, and, and perhaps it is time to consider the option of the GCF Avengers movie um, so that we can uh, mobilize further resources then. Uh, Chis, uh, anything you'd like to add? Um, and by the way, um, Excellency Minister Cole, you had to go to um, a meeting, so he's, he's left the podium, but uh, anything from, any closing thoughts from you, Chis? Yeah, thank you. Very quickly, um, I do think that the replenishment period is... Um, is, is a period where there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of, um, you know, open expectations and the possibility to, to really build um, something with a clear vision of where the institution wants to go. 
um, with its partners as well as countries. So um, I, I do think it's it's a it's a great um, juncture for the GCF to to be embarking on the the second replenishment and this uh, conversation we're having. And I, I I do have to say that I, I do think that the what I've heard so far the GCF colleagues are being an, a little bit modest. I think you have done a lot of great work. Obviously, the journey continues, and um, the direction, quality, speed, and and um, as well as the the destination of journey is very important. But what's important is that you are actually embarking on this journey, and uh, we're all going into this together with a very solid partnership, and we're very excited to be. Um, really enhancing this partnership to really provide climate finance as well as the needed support to the countries. So um, a little bit of a, a pep talk from my side, maybe you don't need this right now, but um, I feel like um, this is a very exciting juncture for the GCF and, and I really hope that the, uh, the countries can work together to really capitalize on the opportunity that's in front of you. Thanks. Thank you very much Hiss, uh, for, for that uh, uh, feedback and um, I want to thank all the panelists uh, for some very helpful uh, reflections this morning, uh, which helps us set the stage as we begin to go deeper into what the GCF needs to do now. I think from what we're seeing on the screen, uh, the, the priority gaps are clear. We need to, and, and the message is clear, we need to do a lot more to ensure that we're meeting adaptation needs. Uh, that we are uh, ad uh, addressing issues of access and simplicity. Um, here I'm just speaking on three clear messages that, that, that keep coming on these priority gaps, uh, but the conversation doesn't stop here, of course. So with this, I'd like to conclude this session and uh, then allow us to move to uh, our next discussion on the how. So thank you very much. Thank you.